The mission of the Inattentive ADHD Coalition is to ensure that children with inattentive ADHD are diagnosed by the age of 8 and that adults with inattentive ADHD receive prompt and accurate diagnosis when seeking help. To learn more about our mission and how you can help, visit iadhd.org. I'm Linda Rogley, and I work with women who are 40 and better who have ADHD. I call it the AD Diva Network. I'm delighted to host three people who have, have undiagnosed ADHD when they're kiddos, diagnosed when they were older. They're going to share their stories with you and insight about what they might have wanted to happen when they were kiddos and what did happen to them when they were adults. This is Simran Dial. This is, I'm just going to let... Simran, talk first. What was your experience of ADHD when you were a kid? What stands out for you? I felt like I always had trouble doing things that other people could do very easily. It took me longer to do things that other people did really quickly. My symptoms were missed because women have a harder time getting diagnosed because it looks different in women than it does in men. Sometimes, sometimes it doesn't. It just depends. I had trouble sitting down for too long. I would try and study as a kid. I had to get up every five minutes. My parents would always be like, you just sat down. You have a test tomorrow. I'd be walking around and around the house, quite literally around and around. I find it funny now because nobody clued in on that, that I couldn't sit down for more than like five minutes. Yeah. I had some tendencies to fidget, but a lot of it manifested itself in daydreaming and doodling in school. I needed to be doodling to be paying attention. Um, teachers would often get upset at me because when I'd hand something in, it, there was no blank space. I would always have to doodle because my mind has to be preoccupied with something to do a task. Even when I sleep, my health was affected. I can't fall asleep. My brain does not shut off. Mm -hmm. And to fall asleep, I have to listen to the same episode of the same TV show every single night for two hours and four minutes exactly. I cannot fall asleep. It's very particular things, but I think the biggest thing that stands out to me is that I just felt very misunderstood by everybody um, and myself. I just felt like there was always something that I knew was different about the way my brain was compared to my peers, mm -hmm. but nobody could point a finger out what it was. Nobody thought that there was anything going on, which sucked because I had to go all the way like that. When we're diagnosed later, it's retrospective we look back and say oh yeah now I recognize this tell us about your diagnosis you got diagnosed at 19 so yeah. what happened and what was your reaction yeah I was about to get kicked out of my undergrad I had a 1.7 GPA I was very my mental health was in shambles I was sleeping all hours of the day I couldn't get off the couch all of this for my whole life was just piling up to this point where I'm, okay, I'm gonna get kicked out of school now because I have a 1.7 GPA I didn't know what to do one day I went to class a psych class actually and the topic was ADHD. So I took out my notebook and I started writing. As the professor was talking, I was, this is me. What she's talking about, this is me. I had this like aha moment. I like called my mom and my dad. Oh my God, you guys, I think I have ADHD. I need to get tested. I got tested and it was an amazing moment because everything made sense. I finally felt like I had the answers to all of these questions that I didn't know about myself my whole life. Yeah, so it was such a relief because I finally was, okay, it's not my fault and I can forgive myself for all of these mm -hmm. failures. Now I can get the help that I need. After that, my life, I just turned it around. I graduated and now I'm at grad school. I've never felt happier and better than I have in the last two years since my diagnosis. Oh, I'm so happy for that. You also had some learning disabilities, right? Weren't there some diagnosed before your ADHD or did it all happen at once? Same time. During the psychoeducational assessment, it came out that I had specific learning disorder in reading, writing, and math, and ADHD, which made even more sense because there's so many things that that's ADHD. Why did it take me a year to read a single book? I think it's so funny because I would always talk about this to my friends or family. I'd be like, oh yeah, I've had this book. It's been six months. I'm only on page 50 in six months. And they're like, what? I finished that in two weeks. Isn't it normal to take six months to finish the book? I had no idea. Yeah. Everything just like made sense. And it's been amazing ever since. That's so cool. When you talked about walking around the house, you walk around and around, that sounds more like hyperactive ADHD, but you were diagnosed with inattentive ADHD. Tell me a little bit more about that. I can't remember exactly what's written on my educational assessment, but I think I may have a combined type with more inattentive. That's 
what it is. If I had more of the hyperactive, it would have been noticed more, mm-hmm. but it's definitely there. It's just not as prevalent as the inattentive. When I'm in class for university, my professors know that I need to leave the class sometimes. I can't sit down for a three hour class. I just want to crawl out of my skin. I, it's very difficult for me. My eyes start like feeling itchy. Like it's so weird. I need to just take breaks. So I always sit near the door. I don't interrupt anybody. I leave and come back and leave and come back. I have a bunch of fidget toys on the right of me. Yeah, always been there, but I think I've had to mask it my whole life. When you don't have a label, then it's harder for people to accept why you're behaving the way you're behaving. Mm -hmm. Um, I always felt like I had to mask everything. Maybe people never noticed my hyperactive side because I had to just sit there and like completely claw my skin in because I can't keep getting up. Got it. Oh, that's so painful for a kiddo. It is so painful for a child or anyone to mask themselves and to push themselves back so that they can fit into society. We make ourselves um, try to fit in. What was your parents' reaction? Because let's face it, everybody missed this, right? (laughs) When I told them I want to get the assessment, they were like very supportive. When I've had to mask it for 19 years, Uh it would be hard for anybody. You're about to turn 20. It was like a month away from my 20th birthday. Mm -hmm. And it would be hard for anyone. You've been along in life, like you're fine. Then they see these stereotypical versions of what someone with a learning disability or ADHD looks like in the movies or just in conversation. And so they're like, oh, that's not you. You don't look or behave like this person. They weren't sure, but they were very supportive. When I got diagnosed, they were very excited for me and they're very proud. What I appreciate about my parents is they don't hide my labels. They're not ashamed. Sometimes, unfortunately, in Indian culture, I've met with family and friends who child might have a neurodiversity they Mm -hmm. don't want to talk about it they don't want to let people know it's a shame it's a mental disorder it's not every single person it's just cultural for some families what I appreciate about my parents is that they are so proud during my undergrad graduation they helped me glue on neurodiverse on my graduation cap they took (laughs) so many pictures and like I tell everybody so yeah I'm so glad. I'm so thrilled to have that. It says in your bio that you started an organization called the abstract genius tell us about that yeah I've started it. The foundations are there, but I'm still learning how to take it off the ground. I still need some more help with that. My idea is an organization, like a community to bring together any type of neurodiverse people, Mm. no matter what they're doing or what age they are. People who are neurodiverse, they're an abstract genius. You don't have to look or behave or have a certain grade to be a genius or be smart. It stemmed from the idea that when I was younger, I was never called smart. I never heard that. It was the opposite. And so now, like, I find it weird when people are, oh, you're at Harvard, you must be so smart. And I'm like, whoa, I've never heard it before. This is so exciting. But I, I want people to know that there's more than one type of intelligence and there's more than one type of smart. There needs to be that change in narrative. That's my hope and bringing these different programs that I hope will take off. I got it. Yeah, we have lots of ideas. That's for sure. We yeah. are full of ideas. Never a dearth of those. That's for sure. One poignant question I want to ask you, if you could send a message back to your younger self, what would it be related to your ADHD? What would you say to her? I would say, enjoy the little walks around the house. Enjoy taking six months to read that book. It's okay. Don't be so hard on yourself. Not the end of the world. If it takes you longer to do something, enjoy that time. Once you learn how to appreciate your brain, it's really fun in there. That's what I would tell her. Thank you so much. It's been great talking to you. Let us talk to Aaron Croft. I want to introduce you to Aaron Croft. He also went to Harvard, so he must be smart too. (laughs) However, he says he struggled for 15 years and then he had a wildly successful career. And that was after you were diagnosed. Aaron, welcome. We're so glad you're here today. Thank you, Linda. It is amazing to be here. (laughs) So tell us a little bit about your history with ADHD, maybe looking back to childhood and saying, oh boy, that was definitely ADHD, but then bring us forward if you would. Yeah. I had the experience of just completely going under the radar. I made it to 34 years old and only I got diagnosed because like my life had fallen apart. I was broke, divorced, earning minimum wage. And I was about to get fired from my eighth job that I was going to have failed at. How'd this go under the radar? What happened is that 
with inattentive ADHD, you aren't a behavior problem. I wasn't an academic problem. I had pushy Jewish parents. I had older sisters who had already paved the way with for me in terms of taking all the same classes, making notes, building a relationship with the teachers. I had smart friends who would be like, hey, Aaron, let's study. Let's do this. Those combined with the fact that I'm a naturally good test taker, I did really well in high school. Yeah. Behind the scenes, though, my parents and even a lot of my friends saw what was really going on. The only way I could get myself to do anything was to be in utter panic mode. Mm. What that looked like is doing all, so finishing homework just outside a classroom right before class started, doing all my studying the night before a test, doing all my essays, starting with a blank page at 8 p.m. the night before they were due. And then when studying came around for tests, borrowing other people's notes and using charm, doing all these things to get other people to help me. Mm -hmm. And it was just laughed off, right? Because I wasn't a problem and I was getting good enough grades. And so they were just like, oh, Aaron's lazy. He thinks he's above the rules. I didn't read a book cover to cover. There were just a lot of warning signs that were just written off as Aaron's lazy. He doesn't care. He thinks he's too cool for school. He doesn't need study habits, which was just not the case. Got it. A lot of us got by our wits for a long time <laughs> before it started to crumble. When were you diagnosed? I was diagnosed at 34 and I do share the story of when I was diagnosed, but I do always caution people that this is not the way to get diagnosed and it's not safe. It's not legal. All those things. I was about to get fired from my eighth job and slash business. Uh, this was 34. I was a year off of being broke, divorced, and earning minimum wage. I'd managed to finagle my way up to this new job that was paying six figures for the first time in my life. It was amazing, but I was in probation. The way I got there that first year was I can operate when there's panic, right? My situation at 33 put me in panic mode. I was able to translate that into action. Right. But as soon as that goes away, I was back to business as usual. They came to me and they were like, Aaron, everyone loves you. You say all the right things. It's just your work product doesn't quite match up to the packaging and what you yeah. put out there. Yeah. I was like, oh goodness. They're like, it's okay. You just need to stay late for the next week or two and redo all the work you've done the past three months and then just resubmit it to the client, no problem. And I'm like, wow, that is past my capabilities. I just literally told a friend that if he doesn't give me some Adderall, cause he had mentioned it when we were out drinking and I'd never even tried it. I never tried any ADHD meds. I need this to get through the week. Otherwise I'm gonna get fired. It was purely just a desperation. I'm gonna get fired. Somebody help me. It was my experience with the medication for the first time in my life. I was like, oh, I don't need to be in panic mode or insanely interested in this spreadsheet and this PowerPoint I'm working on to be able to actually work on it. This is why everyone's so confused, why I can't just sit my butt down and work on something that I should work on. If this is making such a difference, I should research ADHD. Mm, got it. So you thought of it yourself then. It was logical because that was ADHD medication that, that connected the dots for you. But then after that, you went back to school. Tell us about what happened after you were diagnosed. So I'll slightly change the timeline and fill in all the details. But after I took the ADHD uh, medication, which is Adderall, the dose was too high and I actually really hated it. It was just such like a epiphany that, oh my God, it's possible to concentrate on command. I found a psychiatrist who diagnosed me. How have you survived this long in your life? I'm like, charm and <laughs> clever, clever ways to solve yeah. problems when you don't have the skills to sit down and work on something. Prior to that, so this was about 32, shortly mm -hmm. before the divorce, I had gone through graduate school. I had done a master's degree in coaching psychology. Those two things combined were really like, if I look at like the failure and then a V inflection point in my life. Those two things combined really are what made a huge difference for me. The master's degree in coaching psychology taught me that it was okay to make small steps and that small improvements over time add up. That was a whole new model of change than what I'd learned in all the self-help literature and all the pump myself up with affirmations and visualizations and things that I could never keep up doing. But it was like, hey, if you just make small improvements constantly and then that was a light bulb moment. And the ADHD diagnosis gave me first the medication and then eventually the skills to be able to 
start to unpack and unleash some of that potential that I have. Okay, got it. Are you diagnosed in a tune of ADHD? What does in a tune of ADHD look like for you? ADHD is so diverse. My ADHD is different from yours and so forth and so on. So tell us how your ADHD manifests for you. The way it manifests for me and with a lot of the people that I've served is that I have all these intentions and things that I want to do. I even have an idea or a plan or a vision of how I'm going to do them. I go to try to do them and it's just like, ah, got it. it's this intention. It's meeting up with the action where mm -hmm. everything falls apart. I've been able to move past a lot of this. Um, mm -hmm. But what it looked like for so long was just this, if you gave me a month to do something, I was incapable of making any progress mm -hmm. up until the last minute, the day before it was due, two days before it was due. Let's just say we did a 30 day month. Those other 28 days were just filled with anxiety and stress, background anxiety and stress, where I'd be avoiding my boss or I'd be avoiding my colleagues, or I'd just be feeling bad about myself and feeling like a failure, wondering why I do this, maybe screwing up my sleep to stay up late and finish the thing or screwing up my exercise, or maybe because I'm feeling guilty, I'm eating crap that I wouldn't normally eat. And I'm watching too much TV, but ends up with just this spiral. And then of course I would do it. I would feel like, wow, I'm so smart. This is great. I did it. Everyone's happy with me. But then I was like, I'm never going to do this again. And then of course the next project would come with a month deadline. And I would just be doing the exact same thing until the last minute. Then the scary part of that is you did it, but there's always that little bit of fear, at least for me of, can I pull this off again? Can I continue to depend on myself? And once in a great while, no, I can't. <laughs> then everything is revealed, right? It's horrifying. But I'm really glad. Thank you for mentioning anxiety because anxiety tends to be associated often, as does depression, with inattentive ADHD. Were you also diagnosed with anxiety or was it a clean ADHD diagnosis? It was a clean ADHD diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, anxiety is a absolute problem for me. It's really hard to say. Because especially as a male raised in this society where I'm so trained at suppressing feelings, I don't necessarily perceive the anxiety. When I look at all my behavior and I look at why I don't go up and have conversations in social things, sure. Have I learned the skill of being extroverted on camera, this sort of thing? Fine. But that's different than a comfort level with friends and new people and feeling super comfortable talking about things that aren't in a more structured environment like this. Um, just little things like that, little things, just there, there's so many little things, the perfectionism, the self-doubt, it's just recovering from 34 years of really self-blaming, self-talk. I'm glad you brought that up because I really want to ask you the same question that I've asked everyone else. If you could go back and talk to your little kiddo, didn't know he had ADHD, nobody did, no support, what would you say to him? You might have heard me say this because this is something that I try to repeat a lot. I want it really to sink in for a lot of people. There's nothing wrong with you. This is what I would tell my mm -hmm. yourself, right? There's nothing wrong with you. You just might need different looking systems. Got it. And, and yeah, well, that's what we all needed to hear. I think all of us here were diagnosed later in life. That's what all of us needed to hear that it's okay. You're not a bad person. You're not stupid, lazy, put, fill in any negative derogatory term because we have probably applied them to ourselves. So thank you for saying that. That's really important. You now do some work with ADHD, right? Can you tell us a little bit about that? What I've done is really systemize and teach what I learned over my journey going from broke divorce and minimum wage to a successful fortune 500 career and then a six-figure business owner and it's this idea that one we have to work with our tendencies rather than say look i'm not going to develop the level of grit that angela duckworth talks about i don't care how many affirmations visualizations meditation sessions i do my motivation will not be reliable i cannot demand on it and call on it let's just say i'm okay right? I'm okay as I am. Then the step two was if I'm not going to work very hard, I, I don't have much stamina. I just fizzle out. Then the step two for me was, okay, I'm going to simplify this and I'll nail the 8%. So I just simplified and said, look, I know there's things I should do for productivity. I know there's sleep things. I know there's distraction things. I know there's all these best practices. I also know that I hate rules and structure forced on me. So 
I basically said, you know what, if I just do one to two hours a day really well, then I can be free the rest of the time. And so that was my second thing. I'm not going to work 12 hours a day. I'm not going to be overly productive. But if I really focus on two core hours of peak productivity time, I can do that. (laughs) Three was just building the habits and systems around the core things that we need. And then four, which I just want to mention, because I think it's really important, is once we do all that and we restore our relationship with ourselves and our trust with ourselves, our ability to go forward is basically what I call assertive accountability, where we can start to go out in the world. We can start to like demand space, create space, say, I need this environment set up for me. You can make requests to your spouse, your kids, your parents, your friends, your colleagues, just owning our, our right to take up space and our assertiveness is super important. Absolutely. By the way, his program is called Hidden ADHD. So you can find out more about it. Thank you for being here, Aaron. I so appreciate hearing your story and your enthusiasm. I'd like to move along to Inga Shea-Colsey. A dear friend, I will... she is an ADHD coach. She's also a psychotherapist. She specializes in making a difference for Black women executives and entrepreneurs, and especially for ADHD and Black women as well. She was diagnosed in her 50s, and I'd love to hear her tell you a little bit about her story. Thank you so much for being here, Inga Shea. Oh, thanks for having me, Linda. And you are my dear friend. (laughs) Tell us about your ADHD journey, please. 50 some odd years, so I'll try to keep it short, which is not (laughs) always easy with my ADHD. What's interesting for me is that because I was diagnosed in my 50s, when I was young, it wasn't something that was even considered. It's not like it was something that was missing. It's just, you had to figure some things out. When I went into school, I had taken a test to move up and not start at school where other people started because we had moved into the suburbs from the city when I was like five or whatever. Mm-hmm. I passed the test that no one's passed in 40 years and then came home and told my parents all of the questions. <laughs> Can you imagine that bar being set that high? Wow. So then when you start to, instead of like learning to read, reading to learn, then I can't turn anything in on time. Mm-hmm. I'm always late. I'd rather talk to any other child than do any amount of work, and, unless it was the work that I liked. I was a teacher's pet just because I love the teacher. But it doesn't mean I was going to do any of the work. I'd stay up all night and do homework. I'm of that age where your parents didn't help you like that. There weren't really tutors around. There were tutors, but it wasn't like it is now. I'd stay up all night and I'd still get like mediocre grades. That's what it is. It wasn't always easy for me to show my knowledge on paper, but it was really easy to show my knowledge when I would talk. And that made it so confusing for everyone, including myself. I lived all of my life being very confused. It was confusing for me because I knew I could do things and there were things that I did do. I was very successful at certain things and there were things that I could not do or I could not replicate to save my life. That's what was confusing. If anybody's heard me speak, they've heard of my eight years of undergrad story. Eight years of undergrad, no time off. Somehow I managed to do that and not get kicked out and stay in for eight years. It was a long time ago, so my parents could pay for eight years. Being in there that time allowed me to mature and start to figure out my ADHD. We didn't even know that it was, yeah. it was that some teachers took me under their wing and really said, I don't understand <laughs> Because you're really smart, but you don't want to do the things that we're telling you to do. I had a class where you had to wear like a certain uniform in that class. And I was like, I'm not wearing that. It's not <laughs> cute. I'm in the 20s. It's not cute. The teacher who I knew she did not like me because I took that class like four times. The fourth time she called me in and she was like, I don't understand why you can't just do what you're supposed to do. You're really smart. This black woman teacher said, Look, we don't have time for this. You have so much to give and you're doing the opposite. I don't know why you would do that. All you have to do is something that simple. Having somebody who I knew did not care for me because I was easy to live with. I was really like a 15 year old in an 18 year old's body. But for her to take that time for me was like, maybe I need to look at some of the things that I'm doing. Cause I was just not looking at anything. I was just going along my days, doing things I wanted to do and having a good time and not really understanding why I wasn't getting any good grades. Between that and when my father eventually about the seventh year was like, you need to come home. I was on a phone booth having this conversation and I was like, no, I want to stay. I think I have this figured out. And he said, one more semester. Ah. 
from home. The support of my parents, I think, is really important. The thing about the an, inattentive ADHD for me is that I didn't feel bad about it. I just felt confused. They never made me feel bad about it, but they were completely confused. Yeah. Yeah, they were very supportive. Not many parents will allow you to just go back to school and try it again. <laughs> Or even when you're crying after seven years saying that. But when he said that, because my father, I do believe he's the one that had ADHD. He really understood. For him to say something sparked it in me that I got to figure this out. Then I said, all the things that are working for you, why don't you do them? I could not type. And this is the, the typewriters. Mm -hmm. I would do my paper and I'd give it to my girlfriend to type. It would be a couple hours for a class and she'd be mad. <laughs> but I gave her a couple of dollars, but she would type it because they were not grading me on the typing. They were grading me on the work. I would have my friends come pick me up. Okay, we're going to class, right? You guys are going to help me get there. I would find the smartest boy generally in the class and become really good friends. Then they would help me study. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I realized these things and that allowed me to be able to actually get out of school. And then I brought these things, the things that work for you, keep doing them. Yeah. Absolutely. I didn't really figure out the things that don't work for you not to do, but mm -hmm. the fact that I figured out the things that work for you to keep doing them, I think is the reason why I was able to do some of the things I was able to do. Now I yeah. got fired from a lot of jobs and eventually I decided to go to law school, which would not have been a good fit. But the girl who did my nails was like, you should go to manicure school. Cause by then I spent all my parents' money and I had to pay <laughs> for law school myself. I got a job in the salon and then I worked in the salon for 25 years, even after I became a therapist and a coach, you met a lot of people. It wasn't the same thing every day. It had enough repetition, but it allowed me to move around and all of my strengths were working there. If you go to salon, people in your salon, they're your therapists. <laughs> when I decided to become a therapist, it's because I spent a whole lifetime of doing this. Literally. And Yes, literally. <laughs> What's your strength? That's what it is. Being able to listen to people and hold space. That equals up to being a therapist. When I was 39, I decided to be a therapist and then I got pregnant. Mm -hmm. At the same time in grad school, I'm able to get through grad school with no problems, either being pregnant or having a newborn. Now, isn't that different than eight years of, of undergrad? It just goes to show when you can have more of your why. But then I had a why. I always knew there was something I needed to do. When I figured it out, there was no stopping me. But I didn't get diagnosed until my kid got diagnosed. Ah. He got diagnosed in about fifth grade. I still didn't get diagnosed, but I knew that was me when they send those checklists home. I was like, oh, that's all me. <laughs> Even though I was a therapist, when I went to school, we didn't get anything about ADHD. If we did, it was a paragraph and it was about little white boys falling out of their chairs. They never mentioned anything about being an adult. But when I saw the rating scale, it's like, that's clearly you. Yeah, I yeah. got diagnosed when I started to lose my words. I would think of a word, but it couldn't come out of my mouth. Mm -hmm. I was a therapist. So that means I talk all the time. I had heard when I was researching ADHD for my son somewhere that it might have to do with your ADHD. I still had to drive about an hour and a half each way wow. to go get a diagnosis that I could use my insurance by yeah. somebody who would give me a diagnosis. I say that because it's a privilege to get diagnosed. And I don't think that a lot of people understand that that it's not something that's a right and it should be your right to get a proper diagnosis, mm -hmm. but it's not. And I never underestimate that privilege of having that time, having the money and the resources to go so far away to be able to get this done. Um, so I'm going to pull you in here just a minute because I want to tick off some of the things that you mentioned. You said when you were in college, you were able to do fine in the classes that you were interested in. You also yes, said that yes. you were rebellious. I'm not going to wear that uniform. That's our little oppositional piece in there. But I also heard that you came up against deadlines and it was procrastination. We can get it done if we have enough pressure. And that's what your dad did for you. He said, one more semester <laughs> and then you got to figure this out. Were you diagnosed with inattentive ADHD or combined? What were you diagnosed with? I was diagnosed with inattentive ADHD. I've always wondered if I had combined because I am really hyper on the inside. But I'm also diagnosed with anxiety. Ah. There's always that part where... I feel as though, especially for women and black women, especially like ADHD and being a woman equals anxiety Absolutely. because of the ways that we are expected yeah. to be in this world and yes. the things that happen, the pressures that are put upon us that aren't put upon mm -hmm. other people that I'm anxious because I know I, on some level, I feel like I should be quiet and mm -hmm. not take up space in this space with everybody. And, but I have these things to get out. So I better say them all really quickly. Now. 
and I should make sure that my background is perfect because it has to look perfect ah. because we're perfect. And I'm a black woman. I better show up here and look in a certain way because we don't show up that way. Other black women will be looking to see what I'm doing ah. more because it's, I can live well with ADHD. And I take that really seriously. That's a lot of pressure, which could make anxiety. What I have learned is that I'm always going to have ADHD. I've always had ADHD. I'm never going to get rid of my ADHD. I can take all these things on mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to be perfect. That feeling of anxiety is just a feeling, but it's not something that has to run my life. It can go away. I could feel a different way. Being here with you, making me comfortable makes it go away. Putting myself in spaces that make me feel more comfortable help with that. Where does the inattentive quote unquote combine with the anxiety and other comorbidities, learning differences. Yeah. I have a visual processing disorder. I'm sure I have a lot of other learning disorders. My son is diagnosed with inattentive ADHD. I'm diagnosed with combined type ADHD, but I've always said inattentive ADHD folks may not look like the hyperactive person. We're not carrying our desk around on our head and that kind of stuff and running around the classroom, but we are still hyperactive in our brains. And, and it has a lot to do with worrying and ruminating and getting it perfect. I really appreciate that you have done so much good work about understanding your ADHD, but also acknowledging it ain't going anywhere. <laughs> it's here to stay. We can do all kinds of strategies and still, it'll still pop up in unexpected moments. I want to ask you the same question I've asked everyone else. If you could look back and talk to your little girl self when she didn't know she had ADHD and you were confused what would you say to her? I would say to her, it's okay to be confused, right? Some things I was right about. I could connect those dots far out. We have those big ideas and we're not linear in our thought process. I could connect mm -hmm. dots really far out and people couldn't see it. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> tell her, you were right. You were right. All the times they told you were wrong, you were right. There's nothing wrong with you. There's mm -hmm. everything right with you. Yeah. It's just being in the spaces that allow you to be who you are, I wouldn't change anything because it did give me the ability to feel like I can get out of any situation. I can take care of anything. I know how to figure it out because I had to figure it out. It's just being with the process, girl. You'll be okay. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. That's a perfect quote to end on. We got it, baby. We got it. Thank all of you for being here. It's just been such a pleasure being with you today. And all of your stories are very different, but all have that thread of inattentive ADHD that comes through all of them. The more you learn, the more you know, the more you can reassure yourself and perhaps your children as well. You can talk to your little kid and say, it's going to be all right. I'm looking forward to interviewing you on a future show. Here at the Inattentive ADHD Coalition, we're making a library of videos of interviews with people with inattentive ADHD as they talk about their challenges and their successes. If you would like to be interviewed, please send your contact information to www.iadhd.org forward slash awareness. This has been a production of Inattentive ADHD Coalition. Check us out at iadhd.org and see how you can help us by donating or by spreading awareness about inattentive ADHD. Thank you.